welcome to the Moving Beyond Earth Gallery at the Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum. Thank you for coming to our program. Today this is Suited for Space, a discussion. Uh, we have a bunch of wonderful panelists today. Uh, we have two programs actually today. If you, uh, if you enjoy this program, please come upstairs to 211 where we'll be continuing the discussion, but with uh, spacesuits that you can see and touch and examine informally upstairs. There'll be about five tables uh, that you can uh, explore, as well as a wonderful uh, photographic exhibit on spacesuits upstairs. I'd like to ask you to shut off the ringers on your cell phones and ask that during the program you have no flash photography. Um, that's about it. We're going to be starting our program up in about uh, three, four minutes. So sit tight and enjoy the show. Thank you.
Good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to welcome you all to our program this afternoon, Suited for Space and Discussion. As Paul mentioned, this is a two-part program. Um, more, more bang for the bucks. We are going to have a discussion, a formal discussion down here, and then afterwards, after questions and answers, we're going to have a demonstration, hands-on demonstration of some of the things that we'll hear about today. Um, down here, upstairs in Gallery 211, inside our Suited for Space exhibition, which is a traveling exhibition from the Smithsonian Traveling Exhibition Services, which is based on the Air and Space Museum spacesuit collection. But first, our formal program this afternoon, the discussion, will feature four speakers to talk about the materials, the use, and the future of spacesuits. This is something that I'm really excited about because I don't get a chance. I don't get these things yet. Um, these aren't in the collection. I don't get to play with them. I don't get to put them on display. But you'll be learning as well as I will about what are the materials that we use currently in our spacesuits, what it's like to train for and actually use a spacesuit in today's climate on the International Space Station, and what, um, what the future is going to look like, looking towards Mars missions and beyond, and what spacesuits will look like and what they'll have to do. Um, our speakers for today are, are going to feature um, ILC, it, which is a company that makes the current spacesuits. They also made the Apollo spacesuits that are a featured part of our national collection. Um, we also have two astronauts talking, um, Don Thomas and Chris Cassidy. And we also have the head of the suit lab um, from Johnson Space Center. But our first speaker today is going to be Linda Hughes, who is from ILC Dover. Um, she is a materials scientist. She has a degree in materials science. Um, which um, from Delaware, and she's going to talk about the materials used and how they put together the current spacesuit that the astronauts use to perform spacewalks from the International Space Station today. So, Linda, if you'd like to come up. Thank you. Good afternoon. At ILC Dover, we make the spacesuits, so I thought that I would talk to you all a little bit about why we need spacesuits with the current suit as our discussion point. So a little bit about today's missions, what's going on up in space. Um, International Space Station is where we're doing our work, and it's in a low Earth orbit, not deep space. And these are continually manned, and, and they're the crew members, there's usually two or three, and they're up at Space Station for approximately six months. And when we go outside of Space Station, our spacewalks we call extravehicular activities, and since we like our acronyms, we're gonna call these EVAs from here on out. And um, there's a few reasons that the crew members will go EVA. Um, they, there's a lot of experiments that go up, so they'll take them out. They'll monitor them, they'll bring them back in. And it's also useful to be able to suit up and go out and inspect vehicles or equipment. Um, before shuttle retired, one of the things that they would do would be to go out, take a look at the thermal tiles, make sure everything was okay so the guys could go, and girls could go back home. And um, also to add new equipment or repair ISS. So a little bit about the space environment. Um, there's no air, there's no pressure, or so very little pressure, it's practically no pressure. Uh, the temperatures are pretty extreme. They are from approximately minus 180 to plus 280, which is very, very cold and very, very hot. Um, you're constantly being exposed to radiation. Of course, there's no gravity, so things work a little bit differently. And there's space debris, mainly from space garbage and micrometeoroids. And micrometeoroids are like um, about the size of sand, and they're traveling at very high speeds. So they can do a little bit of damage. So what does a spacesuit do? Well, one of the things it does is provide some protection from the radiation that crew members are exposed to. Um, the, the thing that everybody thinks of when they think of spacesuits is the breathing air and the pressure. 
Um, of course, you can't breathe without air, and actually the suit air is 100% oxygen, and very nasty things happen to your body if you don't have pressure. Um, there is some protection from the micrometeoroid, uh, micrometeoroids. There's outer layers that protect the inner parts of the suit that hold your pressure. And we talked a little bit about the extreme temperatures. So it's super cold in the shade, super warm in the sun. So how's a spacesuit made? Back in the Apollo time, a spacesuit was specifically designed and sized for each individual crew member. And during the shuttle period, when they went into design, they decided that this would be an expensive way to go forward with the new program. At, at certain times in the program, we've had up to 120 crew members um, in the crew office. So 120 spacesuits is a lot of money. So what we did was we broke it up into components. And I'm going to show you a few of these components. Um, oops. The first component up here in the corner is the liquid cooling ventilation garment. We call it the LCVG. Again, we love those acronyms. And this is like a thermal underwear with tubes woven through it, and cold water circulates through these tubes. And um, it keeps the crew members cool when they're working up a sweat, working, doing their job out, out on the spacewalk. Um, the next component is the Communication Carrier Assembly, the CCA. You may have heard it referred to as the Snoopy Cap. And this is what holds their uh, communication so that they can uh, talk to the crew inside Space Station as well as Mission Control. Next you have the helmet, which retains the air outside above the neck. And on top of that is your visor assembly. It's kind of like the crew member's sunglasses. And the next uh, set of components here is the arms. And you can see that there's a lower arm and an upper arm. And this is where you start getting into some of the sizing. So you'll have long arms, short arms, and there's some adjustability in there too. So you can mix and match all of these different components to fit a lot of crew members with just a few different pieces. Um, the next picture here is of the lower torso assembly and it has boots, legs, the brief, which is really your shorts area and a waist, all that come apart and all have their own sizing as well. So again, you get to mix and match those different sizes. Then we have the gloves. Uh, we have a lot of sizes of gloves. The gloves are one of the few things that are custom sized for crew members. Some crew share different size gloves because we do have like 59 different sizes, but if you don't fit that well, um, we can do a custom size for you. And this is really important because all of the most of the work that they're doing on their spacewalks is very hand intensive and if you don't fit into the glove well it's hard to grasp things it's hard to really feel what you're doing there's not a whole lot of tactility which is your sense of touch the next part of the suit here that i'm going to show you is the hard upper torso it's the hut and it's more or less the vest of the suit now, this is the one part of the suit besides the helmet and the visor that is not soft. It's not made out of fabric, it's made out of a hard composite. And that's because on it is mounted the life support system. So it needed something substantial to mount. Um, all of these components, except for the life support system, are made by ILC or a subcontractor for the helmet and the visor assembly. So how does the spacesuit work? All right. I'm going to get out my little ply up here because the spacesuit is made up of a whole lot of different layers that have very specialized functions. And the first between five and nine 
layers here. We call the thermal micrometeoroid garment. It's called, we, we call it TMG. And the first layer here is a Teflon or Gore-Tex on the outside with a Nomex and a Kevlar on the inside. And the special thing about these materials is that they're non-flammable. The Gore-Tex is chemically resistant to different types of materials that the crew members might come into contact with, like propellants from thrusters and um, things that might off-gas from some of the experiments they're taking out. And um, the other important thing about this material is, does anybody notice something about this? It's, the color's white, and it's to reflect out the heat because dark colors absorb. So that's why the spacesuit is white on the outside. The next layers are aluminized mylar, and depending on the area of the suit, there's between three and seven layers of aluminized mylar. And what this does is reflects back heat and thermal radiation as well as other radiation. And um, also, as far as the micrometeoroids go, uh, this whole system works as a unit. When a micrometeoroid comes in, it'll hit this first unit, this first layer. It'll break apart a little bit, slow down. It hits the next layer, breaks apart a little bit more, slows down, hits the next layer, and so forth, until it hopefully gets caught by this layer. This is a neoprene coated um, nylon material, and this is supposed to be the layer, the last layer of defense before you hit the meat and bones of the spacesuit. The um, next two layers is the structural part of the spacesuit. Um, I'll talk about the yellow fabric underneath. This is a, a rubber coated fabric that holds in the air and the pressure. And when you inflate the spacesuit, sometimes it can have a tendency, depending on um, how big it is, and we also have materials that are. It's just the rubber, there's no fabric. They have a tendency to kind of like balloon out. So, and also because we don't want this area really being scratched or anything, we don't want anything to happen to this fabric right here. We have this, it's called a restraint. It's made out of polyester. And this really gives the bladder its shape, helps hold the shape, and it takes all of the loads so that you're not you know, putting this material in tension so that you have a chance of it ripping. All right, and then we come to the liquid cooling ventilation garment layers. Again, this is, these uh, tubes here are woven through this fishnet type knit material that's really stretchy and cold water flows through. And because the tubes there's, there's a lot of tubing running through these uh, LCBGs. They, it would be very difficult if we didn't have a little liner in here for the crew members to get in and out. They would be catching up on those, um, on those tubes. Um, the gloves here, this is a bladder. It's a little bit different from the bladder cloth I showed you before. It's an unsupported film. And um, we didn't put fabric in here because we really need the flexibility and we need to be able to, well, the crew members need to really be able to flex their hands. And this, this makes it as flexible as possible. So that is pretty much the meat of the spacesuit, but there's a few other things that we have um, for crew comfort. Um, what if the astronauts get thirsty? We have a disposable drink bag that is filled with water that sits right inside of the hut with a little straw that the crew members can drink from when they're suited up. And if you're going to be in the suit for long periods of time and you're drinking water, um, you may need to use a bathroom. 
So we have what we call a mag. It's a maximum absorbency garment. And it's a um, super absorbent pull up, I guess. So some of the specialized materials that we use in the spacesuit, um, Vectran is a material that's used in the palm uh, of, the, of our gloves. This material is known for its really high strength. Um, we've also used it at ILC on the Pathfinder airbags that went to Mars. It inflated and bounced around like a beach ball when it landed. Um, another material that is a high strength material that's used structurally in the restraint is Spectra. Um, this is typically used for armor uh, on tanks. That's, that's a typical use for this material because of its high strength. Um, Gore-Tex and Teflon. We use those because of their non-flammable characteristics. Uh, sometimes we use them because they're very slippery, low coefficient of friction um, in places where, you know, if there's, there's a lot of motion and you don't want things to wear or get abraded. And we also use a material called turtle skin, which is a very, very tightly woven um, material. It's, the material that we use is specifically made from Vectran to help protect from punctures because uh, back in about 2005, as the space station started getting older, we realized that we were damaging our gloves. And one of the suspects was handrails that have been hit by that micrometeoroid debris. And it creates these craters with very sharp edges. So we had to protect against cut and puncture. So um, turtle skin provides us that because you can't puncture it. And it's very cut resistant material when it's made out of the Vectran. And then um, we also use high strength, high tenacity um, polyesters and nylon fabrics throughout the suit as well. So I hope that you enjoyed the presentation, learned a little bit about the spacesuits, and thank you for your time. Thank you, Linda. Um, we're going to try to hold, we're going to hold our questions. I know you all have very many questions until at the end of the program, and we can have all of our speakers be able to answer them. Our next speakers, we have um, two astronauts, um, Don Thomas and Chris Cassidy. Don Thomas is a former NASA astronaut who is from Cleveland, Ohio. Ohio. He went to Case Western Reserve and got his PhD in material science also um, from Cornell University. And Chris Cassidy is a Naval Academy graduate um, and has an, an, a master's degree from MIT. And they're going to talk about the experience of using a spacesuit while in orbit. Thank you. Donnie, Chris. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. And you all heard we wear diapers underneath our spacesuit, but that is not to leave this room here today, OK? <laughs> that, that was a secret, especially for our kids there. Hey, for everything we do in space, we train extensively for that. You know, the launch to get up to space only takes eight and a half minutes, and we're up there. But for that eight and a half minute ride, we train hundreds and hundreds of hours in simulators just to be ready. And the same is true for doing a spacewalk, for doing an EVA, going outside. You may be outside for six, seven, eight hours, something like that on a spacewalk, but you're going to train hundreds of hours in preparation for that. And there's a lot of things that we do to train for, for EVAs, for spacewalks here on Earth. Most of our training, our primary training, is done underwater. And we call this a neutral buoyancy simulator. So we go underwater, and if you're in a spacesuit, it's like being in a giant balloon or bubble, and you would like to float to the surface. But what we do in the spacesuit is add weights to the arms, to the legs, around the chest, and it'll pull you down in the water so you don't float up and you don't sink down. So they can place us in the water, just put you in one location, and, and you'll stay in position there, so it's a lot like being in space in that regard. We still have the force of gravity on us, so when I lift my arm underwater, I'm still fighting gravity, 
But the main uh, purpose of that neutral buoyancy, uh, doing the water, you know, the training underwater, is just to get the weight of that suit off of us. The space suit, as you heard, it weighs about 300, 350 pounds, and we couldn't operate you know, here on Earth in gravity with that. So the underwater training helps us with that. I started my training at NASA in 1990, and we had a big swimming pool. It was called the WETF, the, the Weightless Environment Training Facility. And it was like a swimming pool, about 75 uh, feet long, um, 25 feet wide or so, and 25 feet deep. And that, at the bottom of the pool, we had a model of the space shuttle. And that's where we'd go and practice leaving the airlock, uh, doing any work that we'd be doing in the payload bay, be it repairing a satellite, or doing repair work, say uh, the doors on the shuttle couldn't close properly, we would train there to, to go underwater and, and, or to go out and, and do that as well. We also had a, a, se a separate uh, water tank at the Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama. That one was 25 feet across and I think 40 feet deep, or 75 feet across, 40 feet deep. It was a lot deeper, so we could put a model of the Hubble Space Telescope. You see a huge model of the Hubble out in the next gallery outside. Go take a look. You'll see how big that is, and that was too big for the 25-foot depth pool, so they had a new pool for that that we used. And then in the mid-1990s, NASA built a, the granddaddy of all the neutral buoyancy facilities. It's called the Neutral Buoyancy Laboratory. At the, it's near the Johnson Space Center. This is a huge swimming pool, again, 200 feet wide, 100 feet long, and this one is 40 feet deep. And in this pool, we can have uh, all the components of the space station underneath there so that we can practice you know, doing spacewalks in almost all parts of the space station. They're not all in the exact configuration. They're kind of packed into the swimming pool because the space station would be too, bu too big to put into this one pool. But we can have all the components there as well. This pool is huge. It, it has almost six million, a little more than six million gallons of water in it. You know, so it's a huge, huge swimming pool. The Europeans also have a swimming pool they use over in Germany to train astronauts for underwater activities. The Japanese have one. It's SCUBA at their training center as well. And I've trained in the one in Star City, Russia. Uh, the Russians have a, 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 a similar pool called the Hydro Lab where you train for spacewalks. So all countries doing spacewalks, we all use this underwater technique. In addition to the underwater, we also train on zero gravity airplanes. By flying these parabolas up and down, you'll get about 20 to 30 seconds of zero gravity time you know, for each parabola. And inside of a spacesuit, you can really feel what it's going to be like in zero gravity. So that's a true zero gravity simulator. The problem is it only lasts 20 or 30 seconds each time. So you know, it's hard to do an eight-hour spacewalk when you're only doing it in 20-second increments. But it, it's a useful training aid because it gets you used to what it feels like when you're going to be floating up there in zero gravity. And then something else we use for training is a vacuum chamber. They put us inside of a vacuum chamber, chamber about the size of a big closet. They pump all the air out. And then you're in your spacesuit under a vacuum condition, just like you're going to be in space. And you can see what it's going to feel like. The suit's going to get more rigid once you pressurize it. And you get used to maneuvering in the suit, to reaching all your switches. And it also, it's a good thing to build up your confidence. When you're in a vacuum here on Earth and, and you're in the suit, then it's like, okay, this thing works, and, and I'm gonna feel okay going outside once I get to space. So between the vacuum chamber, our zero gravity airplanes, and all the underwater training, when we get to space, you know, we'll have trained for hundreds of hours, but hopefully we're ready for almost any situation that, that you know, we'll be faced with. Besides becoming familiar with the suit, you know, we also have to train on all the procedures that we're gonna do up in space, and we also have to learn about teamwork and, and coordination and communication. We always send astronauts out, as you heard from Linda, in groups of two, sometimes three. And we do that so we have a buddy system. If one person gets in trouble, another astronaut can, can help them out. Or if they get snagged on something, or if they're running out of oxygen, it's always good to have groups of two. And we do the same thing today when you go scuba diving. You always do it in groups of two. We also learn to work with the, the other astronauts. There are some astronauts inside the space station or from my missions inside the, the space shuttle, and you may be working with them, and you want to learn that coordination. Typically, you'll have another astronaut working the robotic arm, and maybe one of you were on the end of that arm, so you have to learn how to communicate with them and coordinate with them. And we're also coordinating with the folks down in mission control, be, be that in Houston, Texas, or at the Russian Control Center in Moscow. 
and it's really important for everybody to be on the same page of what we're doing, exactly where we're at, what we're working on, and what the situation is. And through all that training then, we're pretty much ready, hopefully, to open that hatch and go outside and do a spacewalk. And Chris is a very experienced spacewalker. How many spacewalks? Six, fortunately. Six, yeah. six times outside, so he'll tell you a little bit about what it's like in the real world out there. So when all that training is complete, it's, it's finally time to launch. That's, of course, an exciting day. And uh, an astronaut's life is not all in space. So we're really excited to get on that rocket and get, arrive in space. And it's not a guarantee that astronauts will have a, be given a spacewalk, give, have that opportunity. So I've been really lucky. I did a few on the space shuttle. And during those spacewalks, we knew exactly what the activities that we would be doing on the mission. So we could train the very same bolts, the very same boxes over and over again in the pool that Don was talking about and, and, uh, and then execute the same exact plan. It's a little bit different now that on the space station because it's generally we're no longer installing new equipment. We're repairing things that will break and uh, how do you know what those things are going to be? So we train now just a lot of general tasks and, and getting familiar with a lot of the, all the different places on the space station where there are um, pumps and pieces of equipment that may fail and uh, where we have the spare parts located on the outside of the space station. And on this most recent, I just returned from six months up there uh, in mid-September, so just, just recently back. Oh, thank you. That's great. Thank you. That's fantastic. And, and during that time, I was fortunate to be part of three spacewalks, two of which were planned with my buddy Luca Parmitano from it Italy, and one was unplanned. We woke up one morning and Pavel Vinogradov, a really experienced Russian cosmonaut, floated down and said, hey guys, I think I see some flakes of material coming outside uh, uh, from the port side of the space station. Sure enough, we look out the window and, and we see this small, looks like kind of snowflake material coming out. We tell Mission Control in Houston and sure enough, they see some indications of leak on the tel telemetry. And uh, you gotta understand, spacewalks are a big deal and, and they typically take months to plan and, uh, and, and so we thought there's no way we're doing a spacewalk anytime soon so we'll just eat our dinner and see what the ground comes up with and we went to bed and the next morning we had a message on our computers that says welcome to EVA preparation day you're going to do a spacewalk tomorrow which was a Saturday and uh, totally floored us but we're excited and really happy and proud and honored that we could have that opportunity to do it and, and it was it worked out well because Tom Marshburn and I had done a spacewalk together. We had been to that exact same location before. So there was a series of things that made the, the managers and the folks on the ground who manage all this risk trades feel pretty comfortable with, uh, with uh, making that decision to send us out. So that, that was one. The second spacewalk was pretty much um, uneventful with, with Luca. It, we um, did some, some things and, and pretty much a, as, as instructed. But the third one I want to talk to you about because that was most recent um, uh, and we had a really interesting problem. Linda was talking about the spacesuit components and pieces and parts. Well, they're in the backpack. There's a water cooling system and it just so happened there was some weird, weird failure that his cooling water was leaking into his breathing air that was as it came into the back of his helmet it was filling up not only with oxygen, but with water as well. And so about 45 minutes into the spacewalk, Lucas said, I, I can feel some water. It doesn't fit. And we can kick off the, the video here. And there's some, some, uh, uh, some, some shots of that. So anyways, about 45 minutes into the spacewalk, Lucas mentions that he feels the water. He, can, he says it's cold. And uh, that gives people the indication that it's not where could else the water come from? It can come from that drinking bag that, that Linda showed. It could be from your own sweat or, or, or you could be grossed out, but it could be from the urine. Um, those are really the sources of the water uh, in addition to the cooling system. So with that information, and we in Mission Control decided to end that spacewalk and, and head in. And by the time we got in, the water was on Luca's eyes and hovering around his nose and approaching his mouth. So not a very comfortable situation. Really glad that we, we got in beforehand. One other thing I want to mention about a spacewalk is imagine you're on a, uh, a really tall skyscraper and you put your tippy toes over the edge and you look down. You're, you get a sense of you're, you're going to fall. When your first spacewalk, when you open the hatch, 
That's what it feels like. You're no longer inside that spaceship. You're looking over the edge of a skyscraper, and there's the Earth right below you. And uh, it grabs your attention. But soon enough, the training that Don mentioned kicks in, and you know you've got a, a lot of work to do. And, uh, and, and by the time you think that, the sun often sets, and you can't see the planet anyway, so it's time to, time to get to work. Uh, but spacewalks are just a fantastic thing, and, and uh, so, so exciting to be part of installing new equipment or repairing pieces and parts that need, need attention up there on the space station, because it's a fantastic machine that we, uh, our country, and the other partner nations have built and are currently operating in a magnificent way. So there's, in the final bits of the video here are uh, showing the cleanup from, from that water activity. I think that's all we have, and we'll hold the questions for later. And, and uh, thanks a lot. Thank you both. Um, our final speaker for this part, this part of the program is Amy Ross. And Amy, Amy has an incredible job and something that people don't usually think about when they think about NASA. They think about NASA doing the present, monitoring um, space station activities, sending probes to Mars. Ma Amy is in charge of designing the next generation spacesuit. She's in charge of the suit lab down at Johnson Space Center. Amy Ross has her degrees in, um, from Purdue University and engineering and has been in charge of the spacesuit since the first director retired. She's only the second person in charge of this, um, this lab and it is, I believe me, I've only seen part of it, I've only been allowed to see part of it, but it is the neatest place in the world where they're thinking far off into the future how to preserve life in a, in a spacesuit, design that personalized spacecraft for a mission to Mars and beyond. Amy? Thank you, Kathy. Um, so I do like my job. I think it's a lot of fun. And NASA is about the future. And so I get to think about past what we're doing today and imagine about exploring beyond, beyond space station, beyond the moon even. Although I'd love to go back to the moon too. That'd be great. <laughs> so a lot of what we've done to date, other than Apollo, has been microgravity spacewalks. And so um, I get to work on spacesuits that do more than that. They do walking as well. So although we don't have a mission to Mars yet, that is a long-term goal, and we use it as a challenge. So you always want to have a goal that's hard, right? So like maybe you can run a mile today, but you want to run a marathon. Well, maybe we're doing microgravity spacewalks today in space station, but we want to go to Mars. And so that's what inspires you, and that's what challenges you, and that's what makes you try to build better and do more. So I work on spacesuits for future exploration. And this is a picture of one of our um, prototypes. So I'm going to show you some of our prototypes and talk a little bit about what we're doing today for tomorrow. Okay? So this is the Mark III with a liquid air backpack. And I'll talk a little bit about how we test these as well. Oh, and I'm in charge. So. <laughs> okay. So this just gives you a little bit of a perspective about some of the things you can see here at the Smithsonian, some of the things that Kathy has in her collection, and some of the things that she doesn't because I don't give them to her yet. Okay, so while we're working on the spacesuits that fly, we're also building prototype spacesuits, new single, de single one of design, unique one of a kind spacesuits that we then test and try to learn how to build better spacesuits. Okay, this chart and the next chart just give you a little bit of the idea of the challenge we're facing. If you look at these numbers, these were kind of the plans for Apollo and how much walking they were going to do. And so if you start adding up different steps and models about how much work you're going to do, they were talking about just walking steps, 45,560 walking steps for Apollo missions. Okay. So we have to test spacesuits and make sure that they can do these things. When you talk about Mars, a Mars mission versus days is months or even years. 500-day surface day in this assumption, talk about how many EVAs you want to do, how many cycles that is. So by the time you add up all the numbers with all the hours of use, it's hundreds of thousands to millions of walking cycles. So we have a durability life issue associated with our development as well. So we work with folks like Linda Hughes at ILC Dover trying to make sure that we pick materials that can have these kind of lifespans. 
Okay? Now, I want to let you see some of these pictures about the mobility in our spacesuits. Okay, when you think about a spacesuit, microgravity spacesuits typically have reasonably good upper torso mobility, and then they're stiff from the waist down. <laughs> okay, there's not a lot of mobility there. Um, and, and that's on purpose, because a lot of times you want to, when you get in a foot restraint to do microgravity EVA, you want your lower torso to be relatively stable so that you can do your work with your upper torso. Okay. I work with folks like geologists. Do you know what, what geologists like to do? They like to pick up rocks, okay? And they don't want the easy to get rocks right here close to you. They want the hard to get rocks up the slope, over the hill, down the crevice. That's the cool rock. <laughs> so we need to let them get to that rock, pick that rock up, and come back. And so we want them to be able to do things like that. And then we also want them to be able to do things where they can do some of the science outside on their EVA. So you might want to pick up 500 rocks, but you don't want to bring home 500 rocks. So let's decide if this rock is the same rock that we have more of, and we'll just make a note of that, or is this a new and different rock that we want to take back? So that's some of that science you could do. So these are pictures from our field testing where we go out, take our prototype spacesuits out, and try to imagine what you would do on a Mars or Moon mission, exploration mission, and do those tasks and learn if our spacesuits are allowing the, the subjects to be successful in those tasks or not. Okay, and this is a different kind of suit here. It's a rear injury suit. The Russian Orlan suit is also a rear injury suit. And there are several advantages to mobility for having a rear injury suit. Okay, here's just some more pictures. Um, this subject is putting out a geophone. And so a geophone is um, something geologists use to be able to um, put a set of a string of them and then they can pound the ground like in Jurassic Park and they can see the under um, subsurface structure of the earth, okay? And uh, just as, a <laughs> as fun, uh, that's the kind of mobility you have. You know, when you feel more mobile and capable, I used to be a gymnast. When I felt strong and, and like I was limber, I could do more things. I was confident to go do my flip-flops and things. Um, when you don't feel like you're stable, like when I'm walking in heels, <laughs> I don't try to do anything but walk on the smoothest path I can find, okay? Well, when you feel confident about the spacesuit uh, mobility, you can have some fun. This is on the reduced gravity aircraft. So this isn't one gravity, this is one third gravity. This is Mars gravity. Okay, here's another type of prototype suit that we have. Whereas um, the Mark III has a hard upper torso and hard hip and brief elements, this suit has, uh, it's all soft goods based with some um, bearings, metal bearings involved. So you can see the bearings here on the Mark III here, 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 here. <laughs> okay. Um, the spacesuit is a pressurized balloon. It's a pressure vessel. If you want to, it to, tw to twist, you need to put a bearing there. Because imagine making a balloon animal. When you twist it, if you let go, it's going to spring right back. So you have to fight that if you're trying to build, um, twist it without a bearing in there. Well, we build bearings in the suit, and the shuttle EMU has bearings as well that uh, allow the spacesuit to move. Okay, And so this suit has bearings as well. And again, out at field test, doing different kinds of, of tasks digging up samples. <laughs> and you know, in Apollo, they had these tools because they couldn't bend down and pick up the rocks. We'd like to let folks pick up the rocks. Okay, so here's some examples. There's just places we go to field test. And part of what we do in the field testing is we look at all these different interfaces that the suit has. We work with tools, we work with rovers, we work with vehicles, we work with um, other support hardware. Um, for example, we might need to go dis deploy an uh, energy generation system like this heat pipe operated exploration reactor. Okay, so you might need to set that up, dig the hole and set it up in the hole. Um, and then here's working with robots. How do you want to do that? So what's the good mix of robots and peoples? What tasks do peoples do better? What tasks do robots do better? So we can study that in our field testing. Oh, I'll tell you one story. We were at uh, one of our first field tests with the Ames Research Center, and we talked to them beforehand, you know, how, how fast does your robot move? They said, oh, well, it's, it's pretty fast. And we said, well, and they asked, how fast does your astronaut move? Well, you know, it's a suit, it's 1G, backpack, it's kind of slow. Well, so our slow is, their fast was, So we learned something working with them. 
Okay, and then one of the things you're going to want to do when you go to other places is understand if there was a history of life or capability of having life in that place. And so here's a tool that was developed at the Marshall Space Flight Center to search for life that we're demonstrating. Okay, and here's recharging your backpack. Here's doing some night operations. Okay, so we've learned a bunch of stuff about uh, our spacesuits through testing the prototypes we have in various environments, including field testing, microgravity aircraft, uh, reduced gravity aircraft, and um, the water tank. We built this suit uh, a couple years ago, and we tested the heck out of it last year. It's called the Z1 suit. So this is a new series of spacesuits that we're looking at trying to understand um, how to raise the bar. And one of the things we're doing here is we have incorporated um, a capability to work with a suit port. So there's a big ring on the back. It has a lot of mobility. We tried some different elements here in the shoulder and the hip to try to see if a different design would work better or not. And you evaluate that and decide how well it did or didn't do. It's all about trial and error. Nothing's ever bad. You always learn something from it. Okay, what's good about it, what's bad about it. Um, and this suit currently weighs 126 pounds. We'd like to get down to below 100 pounds for our spacesuit. Um, pressure garment. Okay, and it operates at 8.3 PSIG, so um, pounds per square inch. The current spacesuit, the shuttle EMU, operates at 4.3 pounds per square inch. This gives you some benefit of being able to go outside faster because you don't have to do so much pre-breathe to get rid of the nitrogen in your system. Like when you scuba dive, if you come up too fast, you can get the bends. Same thing, if you go outside in a spacesuit too fast without getting rid of that um, nitrogen in your system, you can get the bins. So it's all about the pressure differential, and we have a, high, a, dif a lower pressure differential so we can have faster EVAs. Okay? So this is some of the testing that we did with the Z1 spacesuit. So this is what's called the suit port, and then this is the suit port interface plate, and it's attached to the suit, and that allows you to go from the vehicle into your suit without an airlock. So that's just one concept for being able to do rapid EVAs. And this was a first because we hadn't had a suit in chamber B, which is a human rated thermal vacuum chamber, at a delta pressure ever. <laughs> and it was the first um, suit port test as well. So we're still doing firsts at NASA, uh, although you don't hear about them just all the time as much as you do some of the other um, mission oriented things. We're doing development. Okay, and this is how you get into that suit. So you sit down on the back. And then you start to slide in, and then we put some shoulder straps on you, and then we close the door. So that's how you get into a rear entry suit. Okay? And then the Z2 spacesuit is what we're currently building right now. We had a design review last month, and we have a, a, another look at the upper torso coming up in February. And we're going to have it completed, fabricated, and delivered to NASA at the end of next year, and then we'll do a bunch of testing with it in uh, 2015. In fact, it's another first. We're going to put this spacesuit, the Z2 spacesuit, into a human rated vacuum chamber for the first time since the shuttle suit did that when it was developed. So that's a big deal because um, when you play with prototypes, you're breathing air, you're not really putting people in as high a risk as astronauts in space. In this case, I'm pretty much going to put people at risk like somebody was going outside on a spacewalk in space. And so since um, our subjects are, tend to be crew members we know and my teammates at work, <laughs> you want to make sure you're doing a really good job so that everybody gets to go home to their family at night. Okay? So this is going to be the highest fidelity exploration EVA specific spacesuit pressure garment ever designed. That's the goal. And, and it will be because we haven't ever put one of our prototypes into the vacuum chamber. Uh, and that's what that says right here. And then we've also used a lot more technology in developing the spacesuits. Um, spacesuit garment design tends to be a very hands-on, iterative process. But we were able to take scans of humans, take the CAD model of the suit design, and stick the humans in there and actually get a lot of good design data. We've tried to do that in the past, but now technology is letting us really do that effectively. So that's very exciting. So we hope to get a really good spacesuit out of it. And then that's also the goal. We want this to be the new best spacesuit we've ever built. The Mark III has done a really good job, but it was built in 1989, and we'd really like to raise the bar and have a significant step forward in spacesuit design for exploration and EVA. Okay, so that's what I have, and thank you very much.
Mike, I'm, I would like to invite our other speakers back up for questions and answers. Um, just give them a chance. And just to let you know, Amy, curators never retire. <laughs> So I will so be waiting, waiting for that suit. <laughs> gotcha. gotcha. When we're done with it, you can have it. I have infinite page, patience for this. Um, and first of all, do you, I know all of you know one another for, through your works over the years. Do you have any questions for each other in terms of what you're doing and keeping up um, that you'd like to ask to start us off? Or, I can always start off and just, um, we're talking about a different era, a different era from what I, what I collect as, as a curator of spacesuits. I'm looking at Apollo suits that were made for a very, as your chart indicated, Amy, a very brief period, period of time, brief period of use. Um, and we're talking about 100,000 uh, cycles. How, how do you break that down? into doable components to, to scale up to that level? Well, so that's work that we really need to do because we really haven't spent a lot of time on increasing the durability of the suits yet. Uh, so there's, there's several challenges. One is the mobility. Uh, reducing weight is, adds to the mobility and then the durability. And so you start by building components that you think are gonna last and then cycle the heck out of them and cycle them some more and then you cycle them some more. Double. And then you double that. <laughs> yeah. Um, if you're lucky, you get to use a, a machine to get some good initial data. If you're not lucky, you start sticking people in there and make them just do this a lot, <laughs> over and over. <laughs> so you got to get a lot of folks, because people get smart after a while and say, no, no more, please. <laughs> so. um, we do have a, a microphone set up for any questions, if anybody um, has a question, please go up to the microphone and I believe there's a, a waiver form and a line. Now I know that that, that that was a point I've heard from TK Mattingly that he had to do the box step in the vacuum chamber hundreds and thousands of times just to make sure those suits maintain. Please. Uh, hi, my name is Mike. I'm from Kensington, Maryland. And my question is, when there's an emergency in space, uh, it's like Mr. Palomato had, how long does it take from the time the emergency uh, develops to get back in the airlock safely? I'll, I'll take that question. We uh, just recently had that exact same situation, and it was about 35 minutes or so from the time the decision was made to, to go back until we were at a safe pressure to remove remove his helmet, maybe a little bit longer, 40 minutes or so, and then another handful of minutes, 10, 5, 10 minutes to discuss the problem and make and, and develop the plan uh, with the ground team. So you call 45 minutes. It's not super fast. You can't instantly get in there and be done. Thank you. Is everyone hearing the questions or do I need to repeat them? That's uh, my name is Joseph Burton. I am very, very recently of DC. Uh, I just moved here and this is an, an incredibly exciting opportunity. Um, it's really exciting to see what you're talking about in terms of the future and what's coming up. And I have some questions about, hopefully, the very, very near future. Um, the Orion multipurpose crew vehicle, as I understand it, and please correct me if I'm wrong, is one, intended for deep space exploration, and two, not designed with an integral airlock. Um, I'm really curious as to what astronauts would possibly wear during an asteroid rendezvous or a deep space, a deep space EVA, um, what the crew of the MPCV who are not involved in the EVA would wear while the, the vehicle's depressurized, and how the sort of procedures of pre-breathing and things like this are being changed um, as MPCV development moves forward, and there's some, a lot of plans for uh, the Orion flying without a habitat module or airlock. Thanks. Okay, um, so in my area at NASA, the crew survival team also is operating, and they're responsible for building the, the life support suit. Um, it's also got some emergency limited EVA capability as well, um, but it's basically based off an uh, orange suit similar to the one in the case over there, the advanced crew escape suit, the ACES, uh, which was worn by astronauts on the most of the shuttle flights, shuttle flights following Challenger. 
calendar? Yeah. Okay. Because okay. So, and it, it's a full pressure suit, and it it can hold the pressure. It provides oxygen, um, and it's got a lower operating pressure. So they're gonna have to do some more pre breathe. Um, I think the environment of Orion is also going to be a, a higher oxygen percentage and, and lower pressure so that they can have um, quick reaction times to any loss of cabin pressure. They will just evacuate the entire capsule. And so everybody's going to be yeah. in basically the same spacesuit, and some folks will go outside and some folks will stay inside, yeah. and depending on the crew size. <laughs> Does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, it does. Thanks okay. very much. So, so inside, will, will they be wearing an ACES derivative or? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Also free VA? They're working to develop a little bit more mobility in the, in the shoulders okay. to provide some capability. It, okay. it won't, you know, I'm building EVA specific spacesuits, so I'm going to have a lot of capability. Yeah. They're going to have some capability. Okay. All right. Thanks very much. Yeah. Hi, my name is Orrin Mechanic. I'm from Chapel Hill, North Carolina. Um, my question, and if you wouldn't mind uh, just personally answering, what, what, is, the, what are the, is the process to becoming an astronaut? Well, let's see, Don, you want to take it or you want me to? Uh, I'll start with that. I'll, I'll yep. share my experience. You know, I wanted to be an astronaut since I was six years old, so younger than some of our young students here. And, you know, I just tried to work hard and do my best in school. And we've got two paths to take, either a pilot astronaut or a mission specialist, you know, with a science engineering type background. And I chose that path. And uh, the minimum degree requirement was like a four-year bachelor's degree in science, engineering, math. But that's the minimum requirement. So I, I decided to go on and got my master's degree and my PhD because the competition is sure. pretty tough for those spots. So after uh, college, I worked for uh, AT&T Bell Laboratories in New Jersey, not too far from here, and started applying to NASA to get into the program. It took me four times to get in. First time they said no, second time no, third time no. I just felt like giving up about that point, mm -hmm. but I, I tried a fourth time and got in. So okay. for anybody interested in it, you know, you need a good technical background, work hard in your math and science, engineering type classes, uh, be persistent, just because NASA turns you down one time, they're just testing you. Sure. You know, look at it that way. Uh, we used to joke that they turned you down the first time just to see if you wanted it bad enough. Mm -hmm. uh, that's not true, but it seems like it. Uh, it sure seemed like it. So, I just the only other thing to add is that is uh, it's not a regular routine uh, in terms of the the spacing between the class years. Uh, in the 90s, it was every other year almost, and then, uh, but most recently, it's been four or five year gaps between classes, uh, 2000, 2004, 2009, and then most recently, just this summer, 2013. So that's kind of the trend is about every four years, but it's no rule, it's just based on how many astronauts um, retire sure. and move on to other things. Thank you. And it takes a little bit of luck in the end yeah, to get selected. I'm sure. I'm, we'd all good agree. luck to you. Yeah. <laughs> I, uh, Terry from uh, Washington, New Jersey. Um, you spoke before about uh, the emergency EVA when you were having, when you said it's not flaking off the side of the uh, space station. And you certainly got an email saying, you know, EVA prep day. What is missing involved? Like, when, you, when, when you got that, that email saying, start preparing, what's involved and how long does that take? Yeah, that's a really good question. So the airlock on the space station, um, if you know that there's a spacewalk coming up, you sort of prepare it and get it to be an operational airlock. What's an operational airlock look like? Very kind of Spartan bags in the, where they need to be, cinched down with appropriate straps and things like this, ready for the hatch to open. But on a given day when there's no uh, thought of a spacewalk, it, there's stuff stored in there. So there's lots of... A, just random thing, not necessarily random, they, they all have a designed place, but there's a lot of stuff and equipment that needs to be moved. So you need to spend some hours preparing the airlock, just physically moving things in and out and putting the right equipment in there. And, uh, and then when you go out to do a spacewalk, we put our, our tool chest, you know, our carpenters have a tool belt, we have a tool chest, kind of, and, and all of that equipment has safety tethers, or equipment tethers, and, uh, and you need to build and prepare that equipment that's specific for the task that you're going to do, and that takes another uh, couple hours to get that all, all put together. And in this particular case, um, Tom's suit was not sized for him, so we had to do some extra 
work to uh, change out some of the components that Linda was talking about to fit Tom's specific sizing. So that's kind of what our day was, and we managed to get it uh, completed in a reasonable time and went to bed and got a full night's sleep, but it was a long day at work. Well, thank you, and thank you for your service. Yeah, thank you. Hi, my name is Maddie. I'm from Virginia. Can you move your head left or right in the space suits? She asked if you can. You move certainly that. can, Maddie. Yeah, you absolutely can. But very often the helmet doesn't move. It, the helmet can move around, but usually we just move our head inside of the glass dome uh, and we look around that way. And I'm trying to build spacesuits that give you more freedom to move around and so you can see your feet when you walk and you can see up. So I'm trying to give you even more ways to move your head. Good question, Maddie. I'm Maddie's mom. <laughs> <laughs> We're all curious as a family. We've seen the Russian spacecraft land in the desert, which doesn't look like a lot of fun. Is that how you came back from the space station? And what's that like? It was. In fact, it was the craziest wild ride I've ever had in my whole entire <laughs> life. We undocked, we closed the hatch on the space station about five hours before touchdown. Four of those hours are kind of boring. You're waiting for leak checks and putting on our spacesuit. And, uh, but the last hour, um, there's explosions as the two, there's an upper uh, orbital module and a descent module as they separate and then the heat shield comes off and the parachute opens and the flames on the window and the heat building up and it's just uh, an intense ride uh, culminated with a pretty good thud when you hit the ground. <laughs> but that's a happy thud because you're back. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Hi, hi, I'm Atte, I'm from uh, Helsinki, Finland, and uh, thanks for the great presentations. What I was thinking w about the suits was uh, the prototypes, although exciting, they still seem pretty similar to the ones it used today. So are there like any uh, emerging breakthrough technologies in materials or manufacturing or something which could kind of provide a total new kind of suit? For example, I think uh, the pressure, if you could, uh, you get the pressure from the fabric instead of the air or stuff like that or yeah. any good news on that front? So uh, you've hit it the nail on the head. What you want to do is work on materials development. That's I think where we're going to get the most advances in spacesuits and get much better mobility, use, lighter weight. So that's where we want to spend some time and effort and that's where Linda spends a lot of her days actually trying to do that. Um, now there is a technology called mechanical counterpressure suits. It's been around since 1962, I believe. Dr. Paul Webb developed a, um, what he called the space activity suit. And it's basically really tight pantyhose. And that's what squeezes your body to give the pressure on the body instead of the, the space suit being a balloon and the air putting the pressure on your body. We've done some work with it. We've done some testing at NASA in a vacuum chamber with a glove. Um, MIT spent uh, quite a bit of time doing some development. Uh, just recently, we had a NASA fellow do some work from MIT developing a material that's kind of an active material so that you could put the suit on and then it, you could excite the material and it would squeeze down on you. Um, so that's m more in the right direction about making that technology operable. But it's probably a good, I, I always say 25 to 50 years away from being a real suit. Um, there's parts of your body that just don't want to be squeezed. Okay? <laughs> I gotta so yeah. you got to think about that and how you're going to deal with that. <laughs> there's no shame and no modesty in space and engineering. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. I'd just like to add to that just the, the qualification when. One thinks of spacesuits, one thinks of high-tech materials. And one thing that has been written into all of the contracts thus far for building spacesuits for, for current or immediate use is that they would be made, manufactured from existing materials in order to keep the cost and the timeline down to a reasonable. You couldn't have made an Apollo suit while inventing new materials for the Apollo program. And that's even true of the Z2 suit because we just didn't have the funding to really get that creative with it. We had to use materials we had available. But there are programs, um, small business, SBIR, 
programs where we are taking a look at different kinds of materials that can eventually be developed and put into the suit, um, self-healing materials, for instance, um, nanomaterials with Scratch different types advisors. of functions. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. So to... there is some of that work going on. Well, that is about, all. unfortunately, that's all the time we have for this part of the program. Um, I invite you all to come upstairs. It is the gallery directly above except across the hall. Um, the gallery across the hall and directly above, um, which is Flight in the Arts. It, the Suited for Space ex exhibition is there. And we're going to have um, William Airy of ILC Dover and Linda Hughes demonstrating some of that modular technology. Um, our own Lisa Young, who is our spacesuit conservator, will be talking about research she's been doing on preserving our spacesuit collection. And Don Thomas is going to be up there with a Russian spacesuit um, and explaining the difference between that and, and the launch and entry suit that the NASA astronauts use and what they use today while flying on the Soyuz. So um, I invite you to follow us on up. We'll be convening up there in a few minutes. And thank you all, and thank you very much for the, to my speakers. Um, this was a wonderful program. Thank you, thank you guys thank for coming today. Thank you.